There you go, ring that bell. There you go. Yo, if these dudes are struggling. I'm Staff Sergeant Grayson, an instructor here at the Benny Faison Ranger School. I have served in various light and airborne infantry units, most recently as a squad leader in the 2nd Battalion, 12th Infantry Regiment, based out of Fort Carson. I'm currently assigned to Bravo Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. The history of the American Ranger is a long and colorful one, with a proud heritage which dates back some 400 years. During the American colonial periods, Ranger tactics and techniques and methods of operation were inherent characteristics in our frontiersmen. As early as the 1700s, these frontiersmen, commonly referred to as Rangers, were patrolling our frontier from the Carolinas to the New Englands in defense against the Indians. Probably the most famous and successful of these early units were Rogers Rangers, organized in 1756 by Major Robert Rogers. Presently, over 400 Ranger units have been formed by leaders such as Morgan, Mosby, Merrill, and Darby. Their gallantry and success in combat is legendary. In World War II, Rangers operated in the Mediterranean and the Pacific, and they led the way onto the beaches of Normandy. During the Korean conflict, Ranger volunteers were trained here at Fort Benning, Georgia. They were formed into 18 airborne Ranger companies, 17 of which were airborne, and 7 of which saw combat in the conflict, thus upholding the high Ranger standard for courage and daring. Rangers also served in the Republic of Vietnam, from the Delta to the DMZ, providing long-range reconnaissance and surveillance as eyes and ears for the commanders in the field. In 1983, time period, with the activation of the Ranger Regiment, the establishment of light infantry divisions, and a renewed emphasis on mid to low intensity conflict increased the importance for Ranger training. The Army recognized the need for Ranger qualified officer and non-commissioned officers to provide leadership throughout the units in the Army. The success of this initiative was most evident in December of 1989, when the 75th Ranger Regiment, along with elements of the Special Operations Forces, successfully accomplished their mission during Operation Just Cause. More recently, Ranger qualified officers and non-commissioned officers played a vital key to success in the accomplishment of the following missions. Operation Desert Storm, Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti, Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. The range of course is conducted in three separate phases. Each phase is conducted in a separate geographical location, and each location varies in terrain, from the steep mountains to the coastal swamps. The Benny phase is three weeks in duration and is conducted here at Fort Benny, Georgia, by the Fort Ranger Training Battalion, followed by three weeks in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Dahlonega, Georgia, conducted by the 5th Ranger Training Battalion. Then finally, three weeks in the Florida Swamps at Eglin Air Force Base, conducted by the 6th Ranger Training Battalion. The purpose of the Ranger course is to develop leadership capabilities, confidence, competence, and combat functional skills to select officer and non-commissioned officer volunteers in Ranger tactics and techniques so that they upon completion of the Ranger course, can return to their units with the capabilities to conduct Ranger-type training. This increases the standard of training in the United States Army today and gives all infantry units the capabilities to conduct Ranger-type missions. Ranger school is realistic, rugged, and to some degree hazardous. A Ranger student will be taxed both physically and mentally during the nine weeks of training. However, some students are on the extended cycle program and have been recycling the Benny phase of Ranger school since the summer of 2005. In summary, we feel that the Ranger course is the highest state of combat preparedness training that exists in the United States Army today. Next, we will demonstrate some of the tactics and techniques that the Ranger students have learned. I will be followed by Sergeant First Class Purdue, a United States Army Ranger.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergeant First Class Purdue, and I'm an instructor here at the Benning phase of Ranger School. I've served in various light and airborne units, most recently as a recon team leader in the 25th Infantry Division. I'm currently assigned to Bravo Company. Fourth Ranger Training Battalion. Now, extensive demolitions training enables a Ranger to attack a wide variety of objectives. Now, although there are many different types of explosives in the world today, Composition C4 is the one most commonly used. As you can see, Composition C4 is a white plastic explosive that can be cut or molded into any shape, and due to its pliability, is used to construct a wide variety of expedient charges, a few of which we will discuss today, the first of these being the ribbon charge. Now, the ribbon charge is used to attack any flat or irregular shaped steel target. The next charge that we will discuss is the shape charge. The shape charge is used to attack any hard surface targets, such as vehicles or roads, and can be expediently constructed utilizing any type of cone-shaped material. The one you see in front of you has been constructed utilizing a number 10 can, with the cone shape being depressed directly into the composition C4. Now, as you can see, all of our demolitions are dual primed, and this is to ensure a positive detonation. And the final charge that we will discuss is the timber cutting charge. There are many different ways to employ the timber cutting charge. You can, as we have here, place the charge low on the tree and placing a kicker charge high on the opposite side of the tree. Or you could cut a section out of that tree, place the composition C4 into that cut, once again placing a good kicker charge high on the opposite side of the tree. Or you could encircle the entire tree in detonating cord, something like a ribbon charge. Now, all modern military-grade demolitions are primed utilizing the modernized demolition ignition system, otherwise known as MDI. MDI consists of a low or high-strength blasting cap attached to various lengths of time fuse or shock tube. These blasting caps, along with detonating cord and an M81 fuse igniter, can be used to create a variety of firing systems. As you can see, my demonstrator has a training board on which a few of these firing systems are displayed along with other demolitions accessories that the Rangers train to use. The first of these being the M81 fuse igniter. The M81 fuse igniter is used to ignite all lengths of time fuse or shock tube. Next, we have the M14 firing system. The M14 firing system is seven and a half feet in length. It has a factory crimped high strength blasting cap on the end and has an approximate five minute burn time. Next, we have the M21 and M23 firing systems. These have factory crimped M81s and high strength blasting caps, are 500 feet and 1,000 feet in length respectively, and are used to ignite all military grade demolitions. Now at the bottom, you will see other demolitions accessories that the Ranger is trained to use, to include dynamite, TNT, composition C4, and a flex linear charge. A flex linear charge is used to blow open doors or blow holes in walls so that assaulting elements can gain entrance to buildings. Ladies and gentlemen, please focus your attention to the far side of the pond. There you will see a Connex, whose doors have been rigged with one of these flex linear charges. You will also witness the detonation of a few of these other expedient charges. We're now going to show you a few of the targets from previous demonstrations. The first of these being the ribbon charge. Notice the smooth, clean cut effect. Next we will show you a target from a shape charge. This shape charge blew a five inch hole into a quarter inch steel plate. Now that we have shown you a few of the capabilities of Composition C4, we'll now discuss some of its characteristics. Some of the characteristics of Composition C4 are that it is virtually insensitive to shock or friction and may not explode with any type of rough handling.
Actually, ladies and gentlemen, rest assured, Composition C4 is absolutely insensitive to shock or friction and can be beaten around without fear of detonation. Another technique that the Ranger is trained to use is military mountaineering. I will be followed by Sergeant First Class Westover, a United States Army Ranger. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergeant First Class Westover, an instructor here at the Benning Phase of Ranger School. I've served in various light and airborne infantry units, most recently as a platoon sergeant with the 82nd Airborne Division. Currently assigned to Alpha Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. Repelling is an integral part of the mountaineering instruction taught during the Ranger course. It is a technique of descending a vertical surface by means of a mechanical device and is taught for several reasons. First, it helps the individual get over his inherent fear of heights. Secondly, it instills confidence and teaches him an additional capability. He learns once again there is virtually no impassable terrain for determined, well-trained, well-lit force. In order to repel, certain items of mountaineering equipment are essential. First being the current metal rope. The current metal rope is 11 millimeters in diameter and 150 feet in length and has a tensile strength of approximately 4,800 pounds. Another characteristic of this rope is its lack of elasticity. That is, it will not stretch more than 2% under normal working conditions. The range has also taught the use of the AMK, or Army Mountaineering Kit, which is a nylon harness assembly, the figure eight descender, which acts as a friction breaking device, and the walking snap link, which has a tensile strength of approximately 2,000 pounds. Last but not least, heavy leather work gloves are worn to prevent burning of the hands. To repel, the ranger will simply face the climbing rope at the anchor point to his left-hand side. He will grasp the rope, forming a bite, and feed it up and through the large opening of the figure eight descender, passing it through the locking snap link, which he will then tighten. The ranger will then don his heavy leather work gloves. One of the most difficult tasks the ranger will face here during ranger school. To begin his descent, the ranger will simply face the anchor point and begin walking backwards down the cliff. If at any time during his descent he desires to break, he will simply apply it. That is, the ranger will grasp the rope with his right hand. His right hand controls his rate of descent and supports his body weight. His left hand is merely a balancing or stabilizing agent. To continue his descent, the ranger will simply release the grip with his right hand and continue walking backwards down the cliff. In many cases, it may be necessary to haul personnel and equipment up a vertical surface. For this purpose, the ranger is taught the use of the vertical haul line. Notice the large heavy A-frame that is constructed and lashed together at the top of the cliff with a sufficient amount of climbing rope to reach the bottom. At the apex of this A-frame, the rope is then fed through a snap link or pulley and tied together, creating what is known as an endless rope. At opposing extremes of this rope are tied two butterfly knots. The ranger will simply engage one of these two butterfly knots with his walking snap link and begin climbing the knotted handline to the top of the cliff. Another type of repel is the Australian repel. This type of repel allows the ranger to observe the direction in which he is descending, using his left hand as his brake hand, allowing his right hand to be free to engage the enemy should it become necessary during his descent. In the event that a soldier is injured and a litter is not available, the ranger is also taught other various methods of casualty evacuation, this method being the buddy repel. The patient is secured to the ranger by means of a nylon runner and a snap link that connects to the ranger's own snap link. He is then seated across the lap of the ranger during the descent. If at any time during the descent the patient requires additional medical attention, the ranger can simply break and provide it. <laughs> and then continue with his descent. You may recall the term on repel used prior to their descent and the term off repel used once they have touched down. The term on repel implies that the ranger is about to begin his descent and that all personnel below them should look out for falling rocks and debris. The term off repel implies that the ranger has touched down, cleared his rope, and the next ranger may begin his descent. The ranger has also taught other various methods of insertion, such as the fast rope insertion extraction system, commonly referred to as fries. The fries rig consists of a 3 inch in diameter hemp rope that is approximately 100 feet in length. Additionally, it is attached to a modified H-frame on an aircraft. The aircraft is a UH-60 Blackhawk helicopter. 
with an ACL or allowable cargo load of 13 Combat Equipped Rangers. Today you will observe a lurch scene faster up into the far side of the pond. As you can see, there is a sufficient amount of room for the aircraft to land, and in an actual situation it would do so. However, for today's demonstration, a lurch scene shell faster up onto the far side of the shore. The first action that you will observe is the aircraft commander stabilizing the aircraft over the target area. Once over the target area, a rope will be deployed. Once the rope is deployed, a team of rangers will then fast rope onto the land. As you can see, this type of insertion method allows for a team of rangers to be inserted into a heavily vegetated or urban environment in a very short period of time. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the far side of the pond. Currently in the United States Army, there are several long-range surveillance units, or LERS, that consist of six to 18 man teams that are primarily composed of range of qualified personnel. The mission of LERS is to identify enemy personnel and equipment and report their findings back to their commanders, thus enabling their commanders to direct their resources in order to defeat the enemy on the battlefield today. Because LERS perform various missions in hazardous climates and terrain, special exfiltration methods have been devised in order to ensure their availability for future operations, one of these methods being the use of a spies rig and a helicopter. The spies rig consists of a two-in-one type rated nylon rope that is one inch in diameter and 120 feet in length. Additionally, a nylon harness assembly will be worn by each man who is to be suspended from this rope while in flight. Once again, the aircraft commander will be moving over to the target area. Once over the target area, a bag will be deployed. The spies rope is encased within this bag to prevent it from becoming entangled beneath the aircraft. At that point in time, the lurch team will then move from a cover to conceal position, engage their nylon harness assembly with the spies rope, and then signal to the aircraft commander, who will then lift them straight up above treetop level, avoiding all obstacles in the immediate vicinity, and move out in the desired direction of flight. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please direct your attention to the far side of the pond.
Ranger is also taught the use of small boat operations on inland waterways and coastlines, such as the F-470 Zodiac that is approaching the shore to your front left. This boat is capable of carrying up to 10 fully equipped Rangers. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, this nine-man light infantry squad is organized and equipped for a combat patrol. The squad leader has the additional responsibility as a patrol leader. He is armed with the M4 carbine. The M4 carbine is a modified version of the M16. It has a shorter barrel, and a collapsible buttstock. The Alpha and Bravo team leaders are in charge of their respective teams, both of which are armed with the M4 carbine. The Bravo team leader has the additional responsibility as the assistant patrol leader. The automatic weapon are armed with the M249 squad automatic weapon, or SAW, which primarily fires ammunition from 200 round ammunition drums. However, in emergency situations, may also fire 30 round magazines. The grenadiers are armed with the M320 grenade launcher. It fires a variety of multi-purpose 40 millimeter grenades, such as high explosive, illumination, CS, and buckshot. And finally, the two riflemen, both of which are armed with the M4 carbine. One of the riflemen has the additional responsibility as a squad radio telephone operator. He carries the ANPRC-119 Singar's tactical FM radio, which is capable of sending secure and data telecommunications with higher. The other riflemen carries the mountaineering equipment should it become essential throughout the patrol. And as you can see equally distributed throughout the squad are various pieces of equipment, such as the ICOM radio, PVS-14s, PQ-2, AT-4, Claymores, hand grenades, and the RFR badge. The ICOM radio is used for internal communications between the squad leader and his squad. It assists him in maintaining control of his element throughout the operation. PVS-14s are a singular night vision device used for, during the hours of limited visibility for short range close-in viewing. PQ-2 is a target designator and can designate targets to a range of 400 meters with the assistance of a night vision device during the hours of limited visibility. The M136-84 is a shoulder-fired anti-armor weapon system encased in an expendable fiberglass tube and can penetrate up to 14 inches of armor. The M18A1 Claymore Mine houses a pound and a half of C4 and when detonated, projects over 700 ball bearings towards its target. And as you can see, each ranger carries two hand grenades. Finally, each ranger is certified as a ranger first responder. He is equipped with a ranger first responder bag. He is trained in advanced medical skills such as triage, treating, and evacuating life-threatening injuries found on the battlefield today. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, this nine-man light infantry squad is organized and equipped for a combat patrol. During Ranger School, it is necessary for each Ranger student to successfully complete a series of confidence tests. You have already observed the suspension traverse, which was demonstrated earlier. You now observe the log walk rope drop. The first action you will observe is Ranger Postal negotiating the horizontal ladder, or the vertical ladder. Once on top of the vertical ladder, he will then negotiate the horizontal log to include the three-step obstacle. He will then make his way to the far side, where he will mount the rope using a combination of the commando and or monkey crawl. As he makes his way out to the tab, hangs free, and requests permission to drop some 40 feet into the refreshing water below. What do you think, class? One more? One more. <laughs> drop, Ranger. Small boat operations are not the only waterborne operation the ranger is taught. Helocasting is the means of inserting a ranger squad with use of helicopters. Today you'll observe a four-man ranger team inserted into the pontier front. The first action that you'll observe is the aircraft stabilizing at 10 feet 10 knots over the target area. Once over the target area, the first two-man team will then eject their poncho raft and exit from both sides. The next two-man team will then repeat the same process. To construct a poncho raft, the two-man ranger team will then lay out a standard issue poncho. They'll place their rucksack and any additional items inside. Additionally, they will waterproof this equipment as it will aid in its flotation once it reaches the water. Additionally, a tether line is tied to one end of the poncho. This will assist the rangers by guiding it from the front and, pulling it from, and pushing it from the rear. 
Additionally, as soon as they reach the land, they'll remove all equipment and move out to conduct the ranger mission. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the pond to my front. The Rangers also taught on the various methods of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Your narrator is Staff Sergeant Shucker, a United States Army Ranger. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Staff Sergeant Shucker. I'm an instructor here at the Benny Phase of Ranger School. I've served in numerous airborne and light infantry units, most recently as a reconnaissance team leader in the 25th Infantry Division. I'm currently assigned to Charlie Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. The average soldier, if training only the use of his basic weapon, may become ineffective if his weapon should fail to fire or if he should break it or lose it. But with the knowledge in hand-to-hand -hand combat and the confidence and the aggression to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Ranger is able to attack and defeat his opponent. In combat, our Rangers are often faced with complex situations where the enemy is difficult to recognize. Imagine a team of rangers conducting a combat patrol in the mountains of Afghanistan or in the streets of Baghdad when they're encountered by a suspicious individual <laughs> who appears unarmed but becomes hostile. We teach hand-to-hand -hand combat for several reasons. First, it is an excellent physical conditioner and body toughener. Second, it creates an aggressive spirit and instills the will to fight. Third, it instills confidence in the ranger's abilities and that of his fellow rangers. Fourth, it teaches the ranger techniques in defending himself if unarmed and faced with an armed opponent. And lastly, it serves as a base for the ranger so he knows how to properly set up hand-to-hand -hand training once he returns to his unit. We stress several fundamentals during hand-to-hand -hand combat. First, use your enemy's momentum to your advantage. Notice the demonstrator did not try to match his opponent's strength. He simply used his momentum to send him into motion. During hand-to-hand -hand combat, it is inevitable that the fight will end up on the ground. To defeat this form of attack, all rangers are taught in the grappling techniques of jiu-jitsu. Notice how the demonstrator is on top or the mounted position. From this position, he's able to strike his opponent with his fists and elbows, use numerous arm bars, and even chokes. For example, the cross-collar choke. Notice the demonstrator is now on the bottom. Though on the bottom, he is still the dominant fighter. He uses his legs to create distance between himself and his opponent. Also from this position, he is still able to deliver strikes, chokes, and arm bars. 
Jiu-Jitsu originated in Japan over 3,000 years ago. It was brought to Brazil in the 1920s. Through the tireless efforts of the Gracie family of Rio de Janeiro, it has evolved one of the most efficient forms of unarmed combat. Using Jiu-Jitsu as a base, an integrated system of unarmed combat was developed using elements of Judo, wrestling, boxing, Muay Thai, along with marksmanship and contact weapons training. As a result, we now have the modern army combative program. The first thing the Ranger is taught is a good, balanced position. Notice this is nothing more than a modified box. Next thing a ranger is taught is the different ranges of hand-to-hand -hand combat. First, projectile range. This is nothing more than the range an object can be shot or thrown at an opponent. Next is striking range. This is the range you're able to strike your opponent using a weapon, fist, or a kick. Next is grappling range. Grappling range is further broken down into the post, frame, and hook ranges. This is the post range. Notice the demonstrator still maintains separation from his opponent to allow strikes to still be delivered. Next is the frame range. Notice the demonstrator still maintains separation, but has reduced it by placing his forearm in his opponent's chest. This allows for strikes to still be delivered or the use of secondary weapons such as a knife. Notice the demonstrator has now closed the distance between himself and his opponent. This is the hook range. This allows for more decisive strikes. The next two fundamentals that we stress is that of speed and accuracy. With the emphasis placed on these two fundamentals, speed and accuracy can only be achieved through practice. We also teach rangers to use any means necessary to attack and defeat their opponent. This includes the element of surprise. It's like this every day, ladies and gentlemen. They're always like this. We teach rangers a series of throws, holds, and takedowns. We will now demonstrate. Next, the crosshawk takedown. And the front leg takedown. You'll notice the sleeves demonstrator is very vulnerable. Ladies and gentlemen. In the event the ranger finds himself faced with an opponent who is armed with a knife and he himself is unarmed, we also teach knife disarming counters. Oh. 
will notice the main objective is to gain possession of the knight. <laughs> we teach Ranger a series of knife fighting techniques and vulnerable points, that is, where to strike your opponent with the knife. Counter to the upward stroke of the knife. Since the rifle is more than likely a weapon the ranger will be faced with on the battlefield, we also teach rifle disarming techniques. faced with a situation where his primary weapon becomes ineffective and he must use other means to attack and destroy his enemy. So we teach a series of moves to transition to a secondary weapon such as a knife. Just to get this trash out of my pit! Since ranger operations are conducted deep behind enemy lines, a ranger may be faced with a situation where he has to silence an armed sentry. Therefore, we teach special silent kill techniques. One technique that we teach is the use of a garrote. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will now direct your attention to Staff Sergeant Better, who will demonstrate the use of an actual garrote on this poor, unsuspecting watermelon. Now, Staff Sergeant Frazier will demonstrate the use of a garrote on Staff Sergeant Troyani. Imagine the stealth and cunning it must take to sneak up on an armed sentry deep behind enemy lines and take him out without being detected. Ranger will that kick was a bit much. Hey, Sergeant Torian, if you can't handle it, you come out here and embarrass yourself in front of our Ranger community or the death of our graduating class. You're right. We're professionals. We'll handle this back to Camp Rogers. But for now, let's shake on it. He's going in. He's going in. Hand-to-hand <laughs> -hand combat teaches the ranger to be alert, aggressive, and confident in his ability to overcome and, regardless of the circumstances, destroy his enemy. With the knowledge and skills learned here in ranger school, the end result is a soldier that is capable of being a leader and trainer of small units. He has mastered small unit operations, infiltration and exfiltration techniques, hand-to-hand -hand combat, demolitions, survival, evasion, resistance, escape, low-altitude mountaineering, and small boat operations. 
He is the epitome of the infantryman, the finest soldier in the world. And from what you've seen in this demonstration today, a soldier that is capable of appearing at any place at any time.